Okay, welcome everyone to another week in the Parsha. And we are holding over here in Parsha's Mata is Masi, which is the last two Parshas of Sefer Bamidbar. We'll say Chazak Chazak this week and we will give ourselves strength. I want to focus in on the second Parsha, the very beginning. And the Pasik says, Ela Masi B'nei Yisrael. These are the travels of B'nei Yisrael of the Jewish people. They left Eretz Mitzrayim, the land of Egypt, the Tzivoysam in their legions in the, with the hand of Moshe Aaron. Chazal tell us that there's a concept that we have that follows the Jewish people throughout all of our history, and that is called Maisa Avais Simen Lubanim, which means that the actions of our Avais, of our forefathers, of the ancestors that preceded us, it is a sim, it is a sign of bonding to the children, which means that whatever our previous generations went through, especially those in the days of Tanakh, whatever they went through, it's a sign of what we ourselves throughout all of history are going to end up going through as well. And the Torah is teaching us over here that the Maisa of a sim and the bonim, the Ela Maise, B'nai Yisrael, all the travels of the Jewish people, in the Midbar for 40 years, the 42 different places that they went and they stopped, they encamped, they unpacked, they packed up again, the Anonia covered the clouds of glory surrounding them, the bear shall Miriam, the water, the well that was with them everywhere that they went, the enemies on all different sides trying to start up wars and battles with them, the loss of life, the angering on Kodesh Baruch Hu, the disappointment that we cause him, the Maisa of a similar bun in the sign that happened to our forefathers in the, in, in the Midbar, in the wilderness, is the sign for all generations that Klau Yisrael is always, no matter where we are in history, no matter what is going on, we're always going to be a nation that is wandering through and traveling through. And what we would call will be in the gullus, in the exile of our times. When Klal Yisrael goes into the Midbar, into the wilderness, and they are searching and they are seeking and they are aiming to get into the land of Eretz Yisrael, that's the whole goal. The whole goal is to get into Eretz Yisrael. Remember, what's the reason that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim? He took us out of Mitzrayim, Tabdun al Kim al to serve HaKadosh Baruch on the mountain. Serving Hashem means you're going to get the Torah. The Torah is not supposed to be left in the Midbar. The Torah is supposed to go into Eretz Yisrael and elevate the person and the land. And Klal Yisrael made a mistake. We sinned by the Meranglim. We lost the schus to go in immediately. And we spent the next, I guess, 39 years of our life in the wilderness, going through the travels and the tribulations and the travails of Klal Yisrael. Which means that the bulk of the entire book of the Chumash the bulk of the entire story of Klal Yisrael is the wandering Jew. That's the bulk. Bracious is all about the Avos HaKadoshim. Shmois is about our exile in Mitzrayim and the ultimate Geula, the redemption. But from Vayikra through Bamidbar to the end of Devarim, the three books of the Torah, the last three, the entire focus is on Klal Yisrael wandering and walking around in the Midbar, in the desert itself. And it wasn't the easiest of all times. There were times that were good and there were times that were very difficult as we're going to see. Rashi writes, is it important for the Torah to go and list all of the 42 travelings of Klal Yisrael? We know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu never wastes even one drop of his holy ink in the Torah. He doesn't write any single word, not a letter, not even a kites, not even a, a little tag, not even a crown on top of the letter that is not necessary to teach us something we would not have known otherwise. We already watched, this is the end of 40 years. This is the Klal Yisrael about to embark into the Holy Land. We know where we have traveled. We know where we went. We know where it was good and we know where it was bad. We know where we succeeded and where we failed. We know that. Just roll back the pages and take a look. 
So why does HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with his holiest of all ink, have to write into the Torah all of the travels of the Jewish people once again? It's a waste of his words. It's a very long parsha this week also. It's a long time to be in shul. Could have made it very easy. And they traveled for 40 years and now they're ready to go to Eretz Yisrael. The Bar Mitzvah boy, this is be very happy if that wasn't the parsha was. He said he has a double parsha. Why did HaKadosh Baruch do that? Why do we have to go and recount all of the places again and again and again? And if you look at the, the words carefully, most of them just tell you, they were, they were here, they went there. They were there, they went here. It's Miramas, it hints in certain places about the things, the mishaps that we had, but it just, it goes just like that. Says Rashi, in the beginning of this week's Parsha, the Rabbi Tanchuma Darash Boy Drasha Acheres, the, the Tanchuma, the Midrash, says over the following idea. It is a mashal, a parable to a king who had a son who was sick. And he takes him to a far off land to heal him, to take him to the doctor. Now he went to this far place traveled the long journey, was under the doctor's care for who knows how long. The doctor was an expert in his field and he heals this, the prince. This is the king's son, the prince. Now they have to go back. It was a long journey one way. They have to go back now. The father begins to recount all of the parts of the journey that they took while they were traveling. Amala, he says to his son as they're passing a certain place, Khan Yishanu, over there we slept. Khan Ukranu, over there was very cold one night. Khan Khashashtes Reishcha, over there you had a terrible splitting headache. Vechulei, Vechulei, says the Midrash, etc., etc. The king looks at his son, and everywhere they go, he reminds him, over there you remember what happened? Over there you remember what happened? Over there you remember what happened? And therefore, says Rashi, that is why in this week's Parsha, HaKadosh Baruch Hu decides to tell over once again all of the travels of the Jewish people. Let's just understand the Mashal, the parable. When Chazal speak, Chazal speak not in, because uh, they had nothing, they had no other way to say over the Mashal. They couldn't figure out a better way to express themselves. When Chazal speak, that means they are speaking because these details and these examples that I'm giving, say Chazal, it's going to teach you the greatest lesson that you need to understand. Number one, it says in the mashal over here, the Melech had a son and his son was a chaylo, was a sick boy. Obviously, if there's a marshal of a king and a child, we know that it's talking about HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the king. Klau Yisrael is the benoi, we are his son. And Klau Yisrael is a chayla, we're sick. Right? That's the marshal. King had a son, a prince. The prince was sick, he has to go and travel to find a doctor. He took him very, very far away to find a doctor and get him healed. So the marshal is, Hashem is the king. Klal Yisrael is the son who is ill. We are sick. And we have to travel very, very far away to go and to get healed. Then we go to that place. We do get healed. The doctor is expert. The medicine is good. Everything works out in the right way. And then as we are coming back, the Melech, the king, our father, wants to tell us, ooh, remember when we were traveling? Over there is where you slept. Over there is where you got cold. Over there is where you had a splitting headache, a migraine, and you were in a tremendous amount of pain. And HaKadosh Baruch is telling us at the end of the 40 years in the Midbar, that when you walked into the desert and you began your travels, you should know you were a chayla, you were a sick person. And all of the travels that we went through, all of the gullus of the exile that we had to sub be subject to was all for one reason. Lerapayisai to heal us from the sickness that we had inside. 
And now that the 40 years are over and you have been healed, you have been cleansed from whatever the sickness was, now you're going to come back and I'm going to remind you about all of the different places that you were at and what was so significant about them. What is the chile, what is the sickness of Klal Yisrael that we had to be healed from? So Rashi before points out that there's really two stages of the travels of Klal Yisrael. There's the first one, which is from when they left Mitzrayim to Kadesh Barnea, which was all leading up to Har Sinai when they would receive the Torah. That's one set of the travels of Klal Yisrael. And the other set of the travels, which were not necessary to happen, we could have left Har Sinai and ran into Eretz Yisrael and lived happily ever after. But because there was a Chet eagle, there was a sin of the golden calf, and compounded on that was the Chet Maragum with the spies. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu decreed that Klal Yisrael, you are now stuck in, in the Midbar for the next 40 years of your life in order to go through the process of the Golis of the exile. And that itself will be Mechap, right? We're learning in Makas together. The Gebar says that if a person kills by mistake, he's called a Reitzeich B'Shoigig. He kills inadvertently. He didn't plan on killing a person. He was chopping wood and the, the metal ax flew off the handle, kills the person who's walking by, all by mistake. What does that person have to do? He has to run to a place called Golis, called exile. And why does he go into the exile? Well, it protects him from people that want to get him. But what's the real reason the Gemara says? He goes into the exile because it's mechaper. It atones for his sin. What sin did he do? He killed somebody by mistake. What's the sin? So the Gemara says he could have been more careful. Could have been more careful. And since that he wasn't more careful, he didn't check the, the ax good enough to make sure that it was sealed in. He didn't pay attention to see if anybody was walking past while he's in the middle of chopping down that tree. And so the handle flew off or the ax flew off and hits the guy and kills him. You had negligence in your actions. Therefore, you have to go into Gullahs and in the Gullahs the exile, you will be in this chopper, you will be forgiven and atoned for your sins. And he might be there for the rest of his life, buried there as well. If Klal Yisrael has to travel through the wilderness for 40 years, it's only because, like Rashi is saying over here in the Midrash, that there was, a, there was an impurity that was on our souls that must be healed and cleansed. When a nation can receive the Torah and then dance around the golden calf, you leave the residue of hate, of sin upon you. When a nation is told, go into Eretz Yisrael, you have nothing at all to worry about. Everything is great, Eretz Toivihi. And you go and you send in the spies. And the spies come back and they create the national hysteria, which is the night of Tisha B'Av, which destroys our nation. So then you leave the residue of hate, of sin on us. And that is a sickness. That is a person that is not well. And therefore, they need to go through the gullahs to the exile in order to cleanse themselves of all of those things. But says HaKadosh Baruch, I want to tell you something. While we were traveling around in this gullahs, let me remind you of certain things. Says the Gur Arye, the Maharal, Ki lefa'omim ha Yusuf ben nachas u'veshalva. Gullahs is not always so bad. Sometimes when you're in the Golis, you're in the exile. There is nachas and shalva, there is rest and peace and tranquility. That's what it means in the Midrash. Over there, you shut it over there, we slept. Sleeping means everything is good. A person that is under duress, a person that is under fire, a person that is out of sorts, they don't lay down in the bed and not go to sleep so easily. But says the father to his son over there, remember? That's where we slept. And therefore you should know that even in all the travels that we went through, there were times where everything was peaceful. If you look throughout the history of Klal Yisrael, you will find like clockwork, whenever the Jewish people go into a new nation, it's always 
generally speaking, it's benaches u b'shalva, things are at ease and things are peaceful. Klal Yisrael has been in America for, I don't know, 150 years, 200 years already we've been here to find out when the first Jew came to America. Maybe it was Columbus, they say, yeah? When the first Jew came to America, no, Avishai, when did the first Jew come to America? They say the first shoe was in time George Washington called Turo Synagogue, I think in the 1700s. Okay, there you have it. Okay. <laughs> the first shoe in the world. So it couldn't be earlier than 1776, some, somewhere around there. Yeah. So we're talking about, you do the math, that's about 250 years ago. The first Jew set foot on the foreign soil of America. And for the last 200 years, it's not been so bad over here for the Americans. It's been Yishanur, you can sleep there. You can rest there. You can get a Parnassa, you can make good money, you can become famous, you can become, you can become powerful, you can build schools. You know how many, how many Jewish schools there are in the world today, in America, in America? How many yeshivas, how many shuls, how many seminaries, how many schools for the girls, how for the kids, <clears throat> all over the place, even here in Los Angeles, all over the place. <clears throat> we lived for a very long time at peace. However, anybody who looks at the news today and they see what's going on, they realize that we're being woken from our slumber. We're being woken from our sleep. There just was last week, I believe, in Muncie, a group of hooligans, young guys driving around in their pickup truck with a BB gun, and they began shooting at the Jews that were walking down the street. Baruch Hashem was a BB gun, and it wasn't a real gun. But they were hitting people like this. They go to jail for a few hours. <laughs> they get released on a puny little bail, and they're back on the streets already. The, the dream, the REM of Klal Yisrael being peaceful in the gullness of America has really and is rapidly coming to an end because it's not the same country that we've known for all these years. You look on the news, you see what's going on in New York. You see what's going on with swastikas in college campuses. You see what the rhetoric is that other people are saying, not, not being bashful at all with how they feel. The anti semitism is always under the surface today. It's coming out to full force. But says the king to his son over there, we were sleeping. Then he writes, Will the him sometimes in the gullis in the travels? How you saw bitzar, we're in pain. They're lacking something. And that's what it means over there when the father said to his son, Remember over there we were cold. Who gets cold? Somebody who doesn't have a blanket, somebody doesn't have clothes, somebody goes on a, a camping trip 20,000 feet up and he forgot, he didn't realize how cold it's going to be, he didn't bring his warm enough clothing over there. That's the person that's cold. So says the king, and this is the king. The king has everything at his disposal. He has a warm carriage. He has fires that his servants will make. He has warm clothing and coats. And yet, my dear son, you were so ill and you were so sick over there. You got cold. You were freezing that night. Says the Maral, you know what that is a sign of? It is a symbol of Klal Yisrael will be in the gullus and there will be times that we are in Tsar. We are suffering beyond belief. When there will be a Chorban Abayis and the Beis Amigdash will be destroyed and Titus will be laughing and the blood will be spilling down the streets and the Jewish people will be crying as they're going into Gullis. There will be tsar, there will be pain. When Klal Yisrael thought that they were living in somewhat of a golden era in Spain and everything looked on the outside like it was good and suddenly Ferdinand and Isabella turned on the Jews like that overnight. And they decree that on Tisha B'Av, either you bow down to the foreign gods or you're out of here. The tsar, the pain, the suffering that Klai Yisrael goes through. And of course, without even having to say it, everybody knows there was something that was not long ago, 80 years ago, there was a Holocaust. And the Holocaust, as I saw recently in the Klausenberger Rebbe, the Rebbe said himself, what he witnessed with his eyes, the achzorius, the cruelty, the suffering, he said, I watched my mother, my father, my sister, my brothers, my wife, my children, all exterminated in front of my eyes. They'll be sorry. There'll be so much pain. Look at all the pain even in this community in the last year. 
how many young people in Rahman of Islam perished in usual ways. How many you say, you know what the most painful thing is when you go to a minion and there's an eight-year-old boy saying, Kaddish, sar, anguish, pain, cloud yourself, will go through all of that. And then says the Maharal, well, the Fa'amim, the Sakana Hayu, sometimes it's even dangerous. And there will be times of true eminent danger that Klal Yisrael will have to go through. And that's what it means over here when he's Chayish, where he says, remember my dear son, over there you had that splitting headache. Remember over there when you couldn't even move, you couldn't think, your head was pounding and pounding and pounding. The danger that the Jewish people will have to go through in the gullus and the exile that we are in. Everywhere that we went in life, even though there were times that it was peaceful, and even though the times that everything was good, the famous Maestro of the Rechon and Vassaman, he came to Germany. I don't remember exactly 19, the end of the 1920s, maybe the early 1930s. And already at that time, the Jews were touting Germany as the, that Berlin was the Yushalayim of Europe. Berlin was like Jerusalem, they said. We're very happy over here. We have our shuls, we have our schools, we have our shechita. We have marriages taking place, people are building homes, we have Parnassah, everything is wonderful over here. It's like you shalim your Kaidish. And Rabbi Khan of Asim was passing through Germany once and he went to a certain shul and they assembled everybody, he gave a rousing drasha. And he said, Yes, you have culture, and yes, you have you have brilliance, and yes, you have intellect, and yes, you have science, and yes, you have your shuls, and yes, you have everything. But there's one thing that is lacking in this town, in Germany. And he quoted the verses from the Chumash that speak about when, when Avram Avinu and his wife, Sarah, they were taken, Sarah was taken captive by Avimelech over there. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu came and he says, Rak ein yiris elokim b'mochem hazeh. Avram Avinu said, that the one thing, my dear king, that you are lacking in this land, even though you claim to be so nice and so kind and so forgiving and so understanding, so benevolent, there's one thing that is lacking. There's no fear of God in this place. Said Rabbi Khan Wasim to the Jewish people in Berlin years before the war broke out. You might think that you have everything, but you're in a place where ain't by years Elohim, there's no fear of God. And when there's no fear of God, there's nothing here. And you better be aware and watch God. And he warned them. He warned them the way that they were behaving. And the, the, the Meshachachma wrote the same thing, that when they say that Berlin is Yushalayim, you should know that's already the sign that HaKadosh Baruch is going to bring destruction upon Klal Yisrael. If you think like that, you're a chile. Your mind's not working. You're ill, you're sick. And you need a rafua. What is the rafua? Gaulus is the rafua. It's not always pleasant. It's not always a bundle of joy. It's not exciting. If anybody sees the stories going on with the Ukrainian Jews today, how they're literally running for their lives. There were people that were in Ukraine, they were wealthy individuals, homes and mansions and boats, palatial estates, doctors, rich men, beautiful families, everything going for them. Today they are, they're on the run. They're ready, they're on the run. They're, they're running for their lives, trying to find a place to go. And if it wouldn't be for all the Jews in the world that are pumping in millions of dollars right now, they would be gone. In the times of the Holocaust, it wasn't a unified effort like this of all of Claudius and raise so much money. In the times of the Inquisition, they didn't get together and do such things. Today, Baruch Hashem, the world's a little bit better off in that respect that we can communicate with the entire world all at once and we can just pump in the money day after day, millions and millions of dollars to help them. But they're on the run. And it's not pleasant to be on the run. Says the Maharal over here that that sometimes in Taimar, and if you'll say, the koze manaf kemine, shumasabim dvarm eva, so what says the Maharal? Why does Akhodesh Baruch have to 
tell us all these details. Why does the king have to tell his son everything? Yesh loimar. The Torah is coming to teach us the following point, which is so important for every single Jew to know. Just like the father is telling over his child right now, the king is telling the prince how much effort and how much hard work and how much travels, and it was arduous and it wasn't easy. And there were days that you felt good and there were days that you felt horrible and there were days that they were safe and there were days that we were being attacked by armies and, and animals and it was a sakana. But we made it, that's the point. We made it through the entire thing. And the king is letting his son know how much he took care of them because he loves his son so much. Every night that was sleepless, where you were freezing and your fever was, ra was, was raging, you should know that I kept caressing you and I put the cold compress on your uh, forehead. I held you in my arms because I love you, my dear son. And as we were traveling and the enemies were coming in on our caravans and you were so scared and you were so nervous and I held you tight because I love you, my dear son. And the peaceful times when we were just sitting there eating our meal, you and I, my dear son, enjoying a good, a good fresh meal, a nice drink, a good schmooze, a good conversation. It's all because because of the great love that I have of you. The same thing is with Hashem. HaKadosh Baruch who sends us into Golis for 40 years. We go from place to place, but at every juncture that we reach, at every wall that we hit, at every difficulty that arise, over, arose over those years, you should know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was metapel. He took care of us constantly. Because of the great love that Hashem has for Klal Yisrael. Yizachru Yisroel Hatoyvay Shosalem, and that is why Hakadosh Baruch is reminding us of all the good things that He did while we were traveling. The Yaavdu Oisa Becholev, and then a Jew who recognizes how kind and benevolent and loving Hakadosh Baruch is, they will turn it back to Hashem and they will serve Hakadosh Baruch with tremendous ava and a rutzon and a desire to bring a nachas, to bring pleasure to Hashem. On one hand, the travels of Golis are painful, and they are, here, they are here to heal us and to cleanse us of whatever iniquities and impurities we might have. For Klal Yusuf in the Midbar was Cheta Egel in the Maraglim, and it was all of the tumor that stuck to their bones from Mitzrayim all of the heresy and all of the hearsay that they had, we had to get rid of it. So traveling 40 years, not easy. Could you imagine being on a camping trip for 40 years? A nightmare. <laughs> when are we going home? When are we going home already? You think that every night is the, the night that after this you go home, you can use some running water, take a shower, you can have a nice hot cooked meal. No, 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 tonight you're going this over here. Another another camp out, another tent. What's going on over here? And the Kodesh Baruch says, with all of that, you should know that I was standing by your side every single step of the way, embracing you, caressing you, holding you, giving you the strength and the fortitude to overcome whatever battles might be there. I didn't leave you alone for a second. Today was the yard site of Rav Yosef Shalom Eliyashev Zeich Hasadik Nivracha. It was the Gadol Ador, the leader of the generation, the Paisik Ador, it was the halachic authority of the generation. The man who sat and he learned, I think, no less than 18 hours a day, almost consecutively. His whole life was Torah, his whole life was mitzvahs. There's a very funny story that the, somebody once came after he'd eaten dinner. And they had a shaila. The shaila was, the question was, what bracha do we make on pizza? 
So he looked at the person, he says, pizza, what's pizza? <laughs> That's not the funny part yet. So he looks at his wife, his wife's the culinary expert. He says, he says, Revison, what is pizza? She said, that's what I served you for dinner tonight. <laughs> he had no idea. His mind was in Torah, that's it, his whole life. He lost two children to terrible tragedies. He sat shiv, he got back up after shiv, he was back in Torah. His wife got ill at the end of her life. She, in the last moments of her life, he was by the bedside, she said, my dear husband, all of my life, I supported you in Torah. Go to the base midrash and learn right now, please. That's the biggest chus I can have. So really, Ashiv, once who never wasted a minute for anything, went to a levaya of a very unknown man in the streets of Yushalayim to a funeral. And he goes to the levaya to the funeral, and he sits there by the eulogies, and after the eulogies, they take the arm and they take the casket and the body and they walk it to the, they walk it to the cemetery. Remember, the Asher was not a, such a young man at the time. And he was a very busy person in his learning and seeing people and giving his psak of halacha. And then he walked with the aura and he walked with the casket and he walked and he waited till it was buried, shoveled in his dirt, and then he left. And nobody could understand why is it that the great Revel Yashif, who doesn't take off a single second of his learning schedule, unless it's like Pikuach Nefesh, it's a matter of life and death, he goes to the Levi, the funeral of an unknown person, and he stays the entire time? So they came and they asked him, Rebbe, what is this all about? And he said, when I was a chassan, about to get married, I was marrying into a very illustrious family. My father-in-law was of Ari Levine, the tzaddik of Yushalayim. My wife, his daughter, tzaddikis. My mother-in-law, tzaddikis. The family well-known. And they thought they're getting a good catch over here with me. But Rabbi Yashu, from the time of his youth until the very last days of his life, he never really was much within the regular yeshiva system. He didn't learn together with chavusas, with partners. He didn't learn together with two or 300 other boys in the room. He didn't always have a Rebbe that he was learning from. Very much of his life, Rebbe Yashiv learned all by himself. He said, I was getting married. The chasana was coming. I wasn't in regular yeshiva. So I didn't have many friends. And I was very worried. What's going to be by the chasana? Who's going to come and dance for me at the chasana? And my father-in-law of, of uh, Ari Levine, my mother-in-law, the whole family, they'll see, I have nobody to come and dance and make the wedding lebedic to make it lively. I'm going to look like a loser. What are they going to think about me? I didn't know what to do. One day I'm walking down the street and one of the neighbors sees me and he says, I said, Shalom. What's the matter? You look so sad today. What's the matter? It's not like you. No, no. It's a, tell me, tell me. What is maybe can help you? So he tells him, listen, I'm getting married. Illustrious family. They're making a wedding. They're expecting the best. I don't have friends. Who's going to come and dance in my chasana? There won't be any bachim there. It's going to be, it's going to be so quiet. It's, it's going to be, it'll be a dud. So the man said, don't worry about it, Yes, Hashem. I'll take care of everything. And this man went. And the night of the chasna, he brought dozens and dozens and dozens of yeshiva bachim to the wedding. And they danced with me like I was the best friend in the world. And they lifted me up and they twirled me around and they danced before me. And the simcha was lebedic, was so lively beyond belief. And I was like a, a, like a melech, like a king standing there in the center of all the attention. My father-in-law, Revar Levine, sees all the boys dancing and he sees all the beauty and the glory. Could have been happier. This man saved my covenant. He saved my honor the night of my chasana. I never, ever forgot that. So when I saw the sign that he passed away today, the least I could do is give him the cover, give him the honor, give him the glory. 
that he gave to me so many years ago on the night of my chasana. It might not always be easy when we are traveling through the gullis. It might not always be pleasant as we're going through the challenges that we will have in our lives. We might be one of the greatest people of the generation and yet feel so forlorn that what's my wedding going to look like? <coughs> but HaKadosh Baruch says, you don't have to worry because I'm with you. I love you. I care about you. I'm holding your hand. I will take care of you. I'll send you one year that's going to look at your face and see what's wrong. And he's going to take care and make sure that everyone's there dancing with you. You'll be okay. And that says the Maral is why HaKadosh Baruch Hu began to tell over Klal Yisrael everything that we knew already. We know where we traveled from. We know we went on that camping trip and on that camping trip. We know how long we stayed there. Who could forget staying in a certain place for over a year? Nobody would forget that. Who could forget that one day HaKadosh Baruch Hu came along and he said, okay, pack up. We're going, we're moving on. And it was a big ordeal to pack up the Mishkan, to pack up the Machanois, the camps. And we packed them all up and we traveled long distance. We got to a new place. And then we had to unpack everything, set up the Mishkan, set up the camps, set up the tents. And then the next morning after a good night of sleep, we were exhausted. Hashem said, okay, you know what? We're going someplace else. Who would forget that? We didn't forget that. But the point that HaKadosh Baruch wants to make is you should know that I'm with you every step of the way. And this, the truth is, we find that one of the miraculous objects that was in the Beis HaMikdash was on top of the Aaron was the Kruvim with the two angelic figures that one looked like a boy, one looked like a girl. And the Gemara says that Whenever Klal Yisrael was doing, was Aisir, it's on a whenever we did the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the Kruvim were looking at each other. The, the image of the boy is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The image of the girl is Klal Yisrael. And when we're doing the will of Hashem, Hashem is very happy, he's very pleased with us. He's looking at us and we are looking at him. When we're not doing with Sayyid Shalmakam, we're not doing the will of Hashem. So then when we're turned away from Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu turns away from us, that's it. One looks in that direction, the other looks in that direction. We don't see each other. So the Gemara asks, what did it look like at the time that Klal Yisrael was going into Gullis when the Beis Amigas were being destroyed? What did the Kruvim resemble at that moment? They must have been moving far away from each other because all of our sins caused that the Beis Amigas will be destroyed says the Gemara that I believe Titus came in and he opened up the arm Kaitish. He wanted to laugh at the Jewish people to see how destroyed we were. And he opens up the Aaron and he sees, lo and behold, to the shock of his life, the Kruvim, the boy and the girl are hugging in an embrace. And HaKadosh Baruch was sending a message to Claudius at that moment. And the message was that although you're going into Gullis, although the base of Mingus is being destroyed, you'll end up in lands that you never heard of before, and there will be troubles that you will encounter. But I'm holding on to you everywhere that you go. I'm never letting go of you for a moment or for a second. And that's the chizuk that a Jew has to take. We all have our own Gullis of life. We all have our own journeys. We all have our own travels, our trials, our tribulations. We all have the cleansing that HaKadosh Baruch has to do to take us like the prince and get us healed from whatever uh, sickness and illness spiritual we have. And sometimes as you are traveling along, a person begins to wonder, where are you? What in the world is going on in my life right now? Kodesh Baruch Hu says, you don't have to worry. I'm Tayreach, I work hard. I'm Metapel, i involved with you. I'm holding on to you, I'm hugging you, I'm carrying you, I'm bearing your burden. Because of Bishvil Avosa Aleim, because of the deep, deep love that I have for you, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I'll never let you go. 
I'm right there together with you. And if a person who is traveling through the world of their own personal godless and their journey in life would just keep these words in mind. Because I love you so much, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you will know that you are never, ever alone in your life. Hashem is right there together with you. Last year, as I was preparing for Drosh's on Tisha B'Av and before, I found a very powerful story. I'm sure that I told it over last year. I don't know if you remember it. The story is so poignant and so powerful and so meaningful. It was the Kaisel. There was a well-to-do gentleman that was walking around the Wailing Wall. And he was walking around and he looked like he was searching for something. And there was a look of real concern that was on his face. And he's walking all around looking on, you know, at the Kaisa, you have the tables there, there's chairs there, there's little shtenders there. He goes inside the building, he's looking everywhere. It's obvious that he's looking for something that he has lost, he can't find it. So he goes around, he says, is it lost and found over here? And they point over there, yeah. You see that guy sitting over there, he's in charge of the lost and found. So the man walks over and he says, excuse me, excuse me. Have you found the handle to a car door? Did anyone turn in the handle to a car door? I lost the handle of a car door. And the man laughs. Is that a car door? This is the Kaisa, my friend. People lose Sidorim. They lose watches. Maybe somebody forgot his tefillin. What are you asking over here? If somebody lost a car door handle? So the man looks at him and says, let me tell you why I'm looking for this door handle. He says, quite a few years ago, he said, my son turned 16 years old. And he was so excited, he turned 16, he was able to start driving. And he took all of his classes, he took out his permit, he took his past his driver's test. And he was excited, he was able to drive. So one of the first days that he had gotten his license, I'm a doctor and I have an office not far from my house. And I realized that certain papers that I needed in order to be prepared for the next day's work, I left in my office. And I was rummaging for my keys and I was about to go out the door. I had to go, it was a rainy night, it was cold outside. And I begin to go to my car and my son says, Ta, what are you doing? I said, I left some papers in the office. I said, I just have to go get them. I need to prepare tonight back at the house. So he says to me, he says, he says, Daddy, he said, it's cold outside. It's raining outside. I got my license. I know how to drive right now. Let me just take the keys. I'll, I'll drive the car. I'll go to the office. I'll pick it up. It's five minutes. I'll come back. You don't have to go outside. You don't have to get cold. You don't have to get wet. I'll get wet and cold for you. I said, no, look, it's a rainy night. The streets are slippery. You just got your license. You're not an experienced driver. It's better. I'll go. You stay here. And you know how kids are. When they want something, they just don't let up. And he kept saying, let me go. Ta, you stay here. You'll stay dry. I'll get wet. Don't worry about it. It's five minutes away. What could happen? And so I said, fine. And reluctantly, I gave the keys to my son with a very bad feeling in my heart. My son was so excited, I trusted him. He runs out to the car, I watch from the window, and he pulls away. It's five minutes to the office. It's about two minutes in the office and about five minutes back. About 10, 12 minutes after he left, I look out the door, out the window. No, I don't see my son. 15 minutes. 20 minutes, 25 minutes, he's not here. Where is he? And already my mind is beginning to run wild with the worst things that I could possibly imagine. And the next thing I know about a half an hour, 40 minutes later, there's a knock at my door. 
And I open the door and there are two policemen standing there. And they said, are you Dr. Schwartz? I said, yes. Do you drive such and such a car? I said, yes. Was your son driving that car tonight? And they didn't have to say another word. I broke down and began crying. And the police officers were trying to calm me down. I was unconsolable. There was a psychologist that they sent along with them. And he said, listen, doctor, we're going to look at the site of the accident. And you'll have a chance to say goodbye. It's very important. Would you like to come? I said, yes, I would. And I get into the police car and they drive me down the street and I see my son's car had slid off the lane, jumped into the other lane and there was a truck coming and it smashed the car on impact. And as we're there and the ambulances are cleaning up and the fire department is there with the jaws of life and they're trying to extract my son and I can't believe the scene that is going on in front of me. And finally, they, be, they remove him from the car and I watch as they take him off. The psychiatrist, the psychologist comes to me and he says, you know, you need to have a possession that will always remind you of your son and will keep you connected to your son so that no matter where you are, no matter where you go, no matter how hard the pain is, you'll always have something that keeps you close to him. And we recommend that perhaps you take something from the car itself as a reminder of your son. I walked around the wreckage. I see the blood stains on the floor. I cannot stop crying. I can't even, can't even process what this man is saying to me. And as I look onto the ground, I see that the handle to the driver's door was broken off. And I picked it up and I said, this is the piece that I will carry with me to remind me of my son. The father now standing by the castle is crying and he looks at the man in charge of the lost and found. And he says, every hard day that I've had in my life since my son passed away, I would take that car handle, I would caress it, I would stroke it, I would think about my son, I would dive into Hashem for comfort, for cons consolation and compassion. Whenever I was missing him, whenever I was longing for him, I would just pick it up and I would look at it, I would stare at it, I would hold it in my hands and I would feel the warmth and the love of my son together with me. He said, I took a trip today for the first time in many, many years to Eretz Yisrael. And I decided that I would bring my son with me to the Kaisel. So I brought the handle. And as I went to the Kaisel and I was davening to the Rebbeinu Shailam, and I was talking to Hashem, I must have put the handle down. And I can't find it now. And I don't know where it is. And sir, that's why I'm asking you. Did anybody turn in the handle to a car door? Because that's the last vestige, the last symbol that I have to remind myself of my son. By this time, the man in lost and found feels horrible that he gave this man a hard time. The man is crying, lost and found man is crying. 
And he says, sir, no matter what, I'm going to find an animal for you. And he goes searching the piles and piles of sidorim and of svarim and tefillin and yarmulkes and shoes and jackets and the like. And suddenly he comes running, sir, sir, I found it, I found the handle. He presents it to the man. And the man holds it close. And with tears in his eyes, he goes back to the kosher and he bows to Hashem. HaKadosh Baruch says, Klal Yisrael, Golis, there will be. Journeys and travels, there will be. You cannot avoid that. It's all cleansing from whatever chayla, whatever sickness it is that you have inside of you, whatever blemishes need to be cured. It's all there. One thing you have to remember, just as when Claudius was going into the Golis after the Chorban Abayis and the Kruvim were hugging each other because Hashem says, I will not let go of you. Says HaKadosh Baruch Hu to every single Jew, do not fear and do not worry because whatever you are going through in your life, you should know I'm hugging you Mishum Avosai because of the tremendous love that I have for you. May we be Zeichem Yetz Hashem that wherever the Masse, wherever the journeys and the travels of life will carry us, wherever the exiles that we will have to go into will lead us, as long as we will remember in the deepness and the depths of our heart that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is right here together with us, as the king took the prince and he was healed and he brought him back home to show him all of the love and all the care and the concern along the way, how much he took care of him. And that was a nechama, that was a consolation and a company of itself to the prince. May we be zeichah that as HaKadosh Baruch Hu sees how much more of the gullus we can go through, that he takes us back on the journey, on the pathway, on the trail to Shalai Mir oh, over there, that's where you slept, over there, you were cold, over there, your head was hurting. But my dear child, the prince, Klau Yisrael, you should know how much I loved you every step of the way. And as he brings us home, we should be zaycha ourselves to come to the ultimate home, the ultimate dwelling place, Yushalayim Yerakadosh, the binyan by Ashlishi, the building of the third base Hamikdash, Imheira Miyameinu.